And then you go home and you wake up and then the next morning you get a shitty phone call from somebody <laughs> and it is totally gone. <laughs> I, I left a, a couple of weeks ago, I left the concert, went home uh, to a friend's room where I was staying and, I, and it had been fabulous and then I, I tripped and mm. went splat on the hardwood floor and uh. injured myself. <laughs> So yeah. Christ, Boom. Very soon now. Talk about contrariety. <laughs> <laughs> Exalted music to a hard floor. Yeah, did you want to? Oh, yeah. Um, no, that's a fascinating thing that happens uh, as an artist. Mm. You finish, you know, let's say mm. my painting. I'll do a painting that's great and you're involved in it. And then, you know, you a week later, I wonder where did that come from? Like, yeah. you know, I, I have no connection and I love it, but it doesn't even feel like the same thing. That's the same with songwriting and when you're in, in the moment you're singing, um, or, you know, you lose yourself because you're connected to the highest of the high. That's yeah. not a great vehicle, you know, yeah. the technique. And you, you couldn't, I couldn't repeat what I did, you know, I can't repeat. I record mm -hmm. what comes to me when I'm writing uh, because I don't remember, you know, it's just a stream. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that's how, you know, a bliss is, is on the spiritual path. Or, hey, how about getting the dishes done exactly to perfection? Mm. You know, even in that moment, you, you have pleasure, you know, and then it's gone. Yeah. So there we have it, right? That's the human experience. <laughs> it's always that, for all these millions of lifetimes. So now, for beyond the night release, it never lasts. Moon of beauty, and then, Harsh sun of day, and baked her frozen lands or narrow streets in fears. Earlier, he gave us that powerful imagery of this. You know, the romance always leads to the, the disillusionment. Till he meets the blissful, compassionate master and takes his stand in the flood, here we have again, in the currents of himself, and says, Enough has been far too much. And willingly and reverently and with joy, high hoped, bows before that one of wisdom and light, saying, teach me and help me. Okay, this is what is distinctive about the third pass. Now the master becomes the center of it. We, we had the master mentioned in the previous pass. The first one, the master really didn't come in at all. But now the whole second half, where five stanzas through, by the way, I mentioned uh, last weekend how the rhythm of the ten stanzas, once you get to know it well, it has a powerful feeling. It's like in a musical composition when you're getting to a point where it's turning or it has to change, there's a feeling of inevitability that the farm creates. And Francis is using all that. So we're past the turn here of the ten stanzas. And he, the great one, who crossed and returned again, over the ocean of fire and waters, that Odysseus, and it would really be nice in the future, maybe in for semester courses on David Goyne, <laughs> one of the things to read would be the Odyssey. So you'd really get an idea about what he's talking about. He's using Odysseus here as a symbol of the perfect master who crossed waters, came back, and, um, okay. Twice born after visiting the land of death. Those of you who've read the Odyssey, one of the memorable episodes is he's uh, told that he has to visit Hades, the land of the dead. And actually when he's there, he meets the blind prophet Tiresias, who tells him different things he has to do. So it's like passing through death and beyond. And of course, in spiritual terms, we could take this, you know, I suppose, passing through fana, the final fana, annihilation to find a fill. Without dying, and so dead to life, Francis is interpreting it that way. Reaching home. Why do you suppose that home has a capital letter in it? God realization, yeah. That's the real home. The real odyssey is to God realization. Where his treasure was, and filling his ship with abundant gold. And, um, I don't know. I'm not going to talk too much, but I, I spent a lot of time when I was a professor reading Homer in the Greek. And um, when he gets to the land of uh, the Phaeacians, there's a king there who Francis interprets as a perfect master, 
who has boats that can carry you anywhere in the world in a single night. And um, uh, Odysseus goes in, and the king fills Odysseus's boat with gold so that when he arrives home, he'll have a treasure, right, to have with him. Like a perfect master, Parabdos and Scaras, that kind of thing. And Odysseus gets into the boat, falls asleep, and it was a sleep like unto death. That's how Homer describes it. So it sounds like Fana, Fana, Phila. Francis is interpreting Odysseus as the perfect master, you know. And then does he wake up on, the, you know, on his home shore? He does, and the boat is gone, and he has no idea what's happened until Pallas Athena comes and tells him. And she actually transforms him so that no one can recognize him. It's a beautiful, beautiful <laughs> message. Okay. And, uh, and returning over the trackless sea to succor famished men says, now we have the perfect master speaking. Fear not, I'm going to read this because that's very, why Francis really could do these things. Fear not, my child, my lover, there is a way through the sea of appearance in which you are swirled, a method of stopping the whirling wheel of rebirth. It's like that Buddhist image, right? A means whereby the foundations of your present house may be shattered and no more built. We had the house metaphor in the last pass. For every knot, there is an untying. For every pain, a remedy. For every ignorance, a replacement with knowledge. Ancient is this knowledge, so ancient that God, on his first arrival back into himself, after his same journey you are making, knew it and brought it down to earth as first avatar, so ancient and yet wondrously new. Now we have the consolation, the love and consolation of the perfect master for people on, in this terrible journey. And, um, and now what we have here is a, another retelling of the divine theme. You know, sings to him with sweet voice the deathless story of self's journeying, of the beyond, beyond state, etc., like to a shoreless sea, leaving himself wandering in ignorant identifications as stone, as metal, as vegetation, etc. It's almost like Baba's own God speaks, where Baba, like that Odysseus, comes back and gives a book, a story, tells us the story. So he inc incorporates, Francis incorporates within this pass, a little mini pass where he does the whole thing over again. And the first time he didn't really tell very much about the whole first half of the story, the beyond, beyond state, but he brings it in here. See, theme and variations, you see the techniques he's using. He's got a little mini cycle within cycle here. How he took his hand and fought the wars of returning and returned. And now we're going to get um, an instance, those who came to the first day um, might recall the avataric theme as a theme within a stay with God, where he'll say, uh, the time was Arthustra, the time was Rama, the time was Krishna. He'll go through the series of avatars. And this is to create Baba, to establish Baba's lineage, who Baba is. He belongs to this series. Um, his various avatars, each one unique and lovely, perfectly himself. Was Zarathustra, bringer of the sacred fire of love, as you were saying, Benaz, about that. Perfect, uh, pure love and pure intelligence. Rama, the archer, whose arrows were shining light. He's depicted that way because that was his weapon. And in book two, uh, remember the love song of John Kerry, we have the dominant image of John Kerry being stabbed by a spear, you may remember that. And he also uses there the image of Achilles Rama Baba, streaming arrows as another variant on the image of the spear with which the lover is pierced. Um, Abraham the Pure, Francis consistently put Abraham in this series of editors, who taught man to worship one God, Krishna, the player of divine music in human hearts. Buddha, the tender, who showed men the passingness of life. Jesus, the only real ascetic. And he, Francis consistently depicts Jesus this way. We were talking about it last weekend. How Jesus was not a wimp. That's one of Francis's themes. <laughs> that he's been turned into this docile, uh, sweet, pacific, um, 
ineffectual figure who can be used for whatever purposes you want, you know, in his name do all kinds of things. He's saying Jesus was not that. They've forgotten about the lion, as a, though we've about the warrior Jesus. So consistently he brings up, now he's the only real ascetic, right? Because, uh, you know, look at the lilies of the field. They sow not and reap not, yet they are clothed in fine array in, in the Gospels. In other words, um, Jesus was um, not advent, was not practicing life of a householder. He was very unmaterialistic and externally in these sorts of ways. Muhammad who lived with men. Okay, and let's see. Yeah, it gives him, let's... Okay, to be his sword, to cut through the hosts of himself. Um, a sword to slay the great beasts of far past. Cut, to cut himself free from entrancement on dazzling plains. And go on, back to the master. He to cut the last veil between him and himself. So this is the end of the third pass. And the third pass is the dominant um, theme there is the perfect master or the avatar who has returned and completed it, completed this theme. You know, the divine theme as we see it here um, is actually does not encompass the perfect one himself. It's kind of our story. The divine theme is not the ten states of God. There's also this, the, the four journeys theme, which Baba related in the East-West gathering, where after realization, some return to creation consciousness, as Jivan Muktas or Paramahansas in the ninth state of God, or as perfect masters in the tenth state of God. And then beyond all of those, there's the avatar who directly descends 700 to 1400 years. So the eighth, ninth, and tenth states of God, we don't have the ten states of God right here, do we? Let's see if I put it in the back of this. <laughs> no, I didn't, unfortunately. Okay. Well, this is the uh, pass that really brings out that. The uh, perfect master and the people who have turned from realization of God. The, the other three passes don't. So I'm just trying to uh, sort of bring out theme and variation. How he... In each pass, how he brings up new things and uh, retells the story in different ways. Now, the last time, um, he introduces a new figure, um, and that is the figure of a tree. And the whole creation is a tree. The first half of the ten pass, the ten stanzas of the fourth pass, is uh, governed. I, there's a term, a governing metaphor, or a governing figure. So the governing figure here is a tree. Can any of you think of some famous trees in uh, world mythology and scripture and stuff like that? Norse mythology. Yeah, it does. Yggdrasil. It's a world tree. And um, there, Francis references it, actually. Um, Further down here, let me see where that is. There's also a tree uh, in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. That is right. Plus the tree of life, in, you know, from which all springs. Mm hmm. Yeah. So at that tree in the Garden of Eden, you may recall that um, Adam and Eve ate thereof and tasted death. Death. The, the tree of knowledge and it brought with it death. So Francis talks about that here. Um, he doesn't happen to reference a tree in the Bhagavad Gita, Ashvata. Um, it's in the 15th book of it, but it's very, very famous, <coughs> and it's an upside-down tree, as a matter of fact. And uh, we haven't talked about him here, but uh, Francis, in book five, a number of times brings up a very great uh, 20th century scholar uh, named Kumar Swami. Have any of you ever heard of Ananda Kumar Swami? Francis uh, refer references to him as Michael LePage was calling it one of the three harbingers of the advent. Kumaraswamy and Nayakan and Vivekananda he mentions as harbingers. He doesn't use that word, but Michael did. It's a great word. Um, well, he has a major essay on the inverted tree, and I'm sure Francis knew it well. Um, so. Uh, well, what about, what is it? 
There's a tree. Babajan's sitting under a tree too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a big tree in Babajan. The Bodhi tree with Buddha. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Once God slept each time, right? It begins that way. And awoke half dream, waking into dreaming. And now he's not going to bother this time about talking about stone metal, reincarnation, etc. He's going to develop these, uh, this metaphor instead and spread out the creation as a great tree, its roots in the nothing. Remember, the nothing and the everything. At the very um, front matter of Stay With God, there's a message from Baba for this book that's on the nothing and the everything. So Francis, even in the love song of John Kerry, as we were talking about last week, I would have thought the everything and the nothing is as unpromising material for a love song as there could ever be, right? It's like, oh darling, I want to tell you about the everything and the nothing, right? You wouldn't think it would work very well. But in fact, he brilliantly does make it the basis for his whole love song. How I'm not even nothing. I can't be nothing and I can't be something. Baba, you know, he uses it that way. So here we have again, in the nothing of his great, of his dream, its branches and leaves and fruits and nothingness of appearance. It is called the tree of knowledge. So this is a direct re reference to Genesis here, to the Torah. Because by it, God came to self-knowledge by eating of that experience. You know, when you get to know good and evil, it leads you eventually to the knowledge of self. For before he ate of its fruits, he, even God, knew not himself. So this is an interpretation of the Genesis story that Francis is giving. The tree of knowledge through experience of good and evil, its sweet and bitter fruits. And because God ate of these fruits and became God, they are not forbidden men. Why would you mention it being forbidden? Because it was forbidden in the garden to have That's right. And because of the, they did eat it, they were expelled from Eden. Well, it's, yeah, so Francis is giving, is interpreting that story, you might say. The tree of knowledge, which is the tree of life. Was it Deborah? So somebody was mentioning the tree of life. Kept living by rivers of necessity, and compassion, and wisdom, and infinite love. The soul growth blossoming universes in man. The tree on which God crucified himself in limitation. Now this is a standard um, trope, the Christian thought. Jesus, God, uh, Christ was crucified on a tree. They will very often uh, refer to it that way. In fact, uh, I was actually a professor of uh, medieval English literature, and there is a very great old English poem called The Dream of the Rood, R-O-O-D, and rood means cross, and it's uh, one of the most one of the really great poems I've ever read. And it's a first-person narrative told by the cross itself, actually. And uh, he's, the cross is saying how I was a tree out in the forest. And they came me and get me and cruelly cut me down. And the cross is actually a disciple, a lover, an adorative lover of Christ. And, yeah. And um, the, the cross, um, in the Anglo-Saxon culture, the, the par dominant paradigm in the uh, poetry is of a warrior. Warriors and their Lord. Warriors who are supposed to be faithful to the Lord. And the cross, um, the rood here, is a, a, a retainer, a, a warrior for his Lord, who's cast in the terrible position of having to be the instrument of his crucifixion. So it's it's really an amazing poem. Francis well, never I, read it. What I was going to say is, may I? Is, yeah. Is that uh, it's interesting to hear that that, that was the source of uh, the story of the, the tree because um, Ellis Pines yeah. uh, wrote a play mm -hmm. called The Tree, and we did it as a dramatic reading at the Ellis Hall. the first of the year that Adi K. Ryan ah. was there. Yeah. And 1977. It was, uh, it was yeah, the what if the movie was there? It was a dramatic reading. You know, it was from well, but I I played the role of the tree. Oh, really? And I remember playing that role just 
tears, as Oprah would say, the ugly cry, it was the tears were just falling to where my nose was <laughs> yes. So I had no idea when I started yeah. deciding that that was going to happen. And then I was later told that Ali K. Rani was crying. Oh. Wow. So, wow. so uh, this, to, to, to think it's so, it's so symbolic and so meaningful that it yeah. had to be how that tree actually felt. Yes. I know you're talking about symbolism. The dream of the root is an unsurpassable oh. expression of that. I think. Okay, the dream of the root. Can I Google it and read the whole thing? Yeah. Good. Thank you. To really get it, you have to read it in Old English. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was taught Old English. Oh, yeah, yeah. This it's is so Old English. Too. That's a foreign language. No, it's a <laughs> tremendous <laughs> poem. Heartbreaking poem. This, po this lover of Christ is put in this terrible position of having to hold firm and not move as Jesus is getting crucified. Mm -hmm. It's so moving, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and here's another thing to be said about this tree, which will we come up in our first and second session last weekend and come up again tomorrow in book five. One of the governing themes of stay with God is the vertical axis to use the geometric term for it. Remember Kailash, wings from the glaciers of Kailash, which um, David can recite in full. And well, Kailash is the mountain, and Francis, as I was talking about in the first session, has, develops it in a number of ways, but one of them is it's a vertical axis. I always think of that um, Leonardo da Vinci, the true man, man, you know, where there's that circle there. It always seems to me like an archetypal expression of the human form as a representation of that. In the human form, as Baba keeps emphasizing, um, that's the first form in which the soul achieves a vertical posture, in fact. And the vertical acts, a kutub, you know, like a perfect master, Q-U-T-U-B, the Islamic term which Baba uh, uses to mean a perfect master, um, is an axis also. So it's from the horizontality of human limitation. It's the direct vertical line that moves to God. So it represents that. So the tree is another figure of that. A kutub is a pillar. A pillar? A pillar. Around which everything revolves. Everything revolves, yeah. That's what they do in Islam, the Sufism, they have the dervishes. Like with Rumi, yeah. Like Rumi. Also, take your stand. Take your stand, the vertical, right, that link. This theme is all over Stay With God. It's one of his governing themes, yeah. So we're just uh, on the cross, it's also the symbol of the intersection of the eternal with the ephemeral. That's right. Francis is going to come in book five. He's going to come back to this very powerfully. And one of the uh, uh, figures he uses is a cathedral. And uh, the cathedral uh, represents that. You know, the floor plan of all these great cathedrals is a cross. Did you know that? And uh, on that is a spire. Well, what a symbol for the idea there. That is, the crucifixion of Christ is beneath my feet. I actually walk on him, you know, I humiliate him through the, you know, through original sin would be the doctrine, or for having my will having deviated from the will of God. By virtue of that, I actually, his crucifixion is beneath me is the foundation on which I stand. And on that basis arises the aspiration to God. What a beautiful architectural representation of the Christian truth, isn't it? The people who came up with these things were not dummies. They really weren't. So Francis is now, this is the symbol Francis is bringing into his final test, using a tree for it. Although it links with all the other things uh, in the poem. I don't know, did we, yes, uh, in fact, we got down to here. The soul growth blossoming universes and man Right? The entire creation is this tree. The tree on which God crucified himself in limitation, and on which men crucify themselves, each other, and dear God. Tree, I'm going to get to Odin because that comes up. Yeah, so now he's going to bring it. Here he does have his evolution. Stone fruits. The tree which grows all kinds of fruits. Um, 
stone fruits and metal fruits and tree, tree fruits and worm fruits and fish fruits and bird fruits and beast fruits, and man fruits. Now the evolutionary tale of the divine is being told as fruits from this tree, this tree of knowledge, uh, which nourished great God on his journey for knowledge and which through eating he became. When you eat these fruits, I eat the stone fruit and I become a stone. As, as the drop soul, I eat a worm fruit, and I become a worm. And overcame. You become it, and you overcome it, going on to the next thing. And became the energy which grew the tree, and became the mind which gives it existence, and became God, which he always was. He's just told us the divine being, in the metaphor of a tree with fruits. It's going to hit us with a, uh, yeah. You can see, you could really spend uh, a long time with every one of these stanzas, you know. A wishing tree, tree, wishing tree, which bears the fruit of every desire. Why would it be a wishing tree, anyway? What's that? Yeah, and when you want something, eventually you get it. I mean, you may not get it for a while, but eventually you get it. Is that sort of play on words? Because it could be the tree is wishing, wishing tree, or yeah. the wishing tree to which one makes... Yeah, actually wishes. the tree is the source of the wishes, right. and the tree is us trying to get stuff from the tree. Right. So tree, that, that tree would be God for, you know, most people's, oh God, give me this, oh God, I want that, you know, and, then, and God gives it. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to go back a little bit about uh, what we were talking about. In Qigong, you know, the, the tree, when you are working on building the tree, mm. you go into nature and one of them is to, you know, you, the tree, the, the power and the energy of the tree, mm. the essence of the earth. Your yeah. earth is in the tree, you know, but like people like this to take it into mm. yourself. Mm. There's this is actual energy. Yeah. That, and, and it builds your energy to be connected that way. Yeah. Yeah, the tree figure is central to so many of the uh, belief systems and mythologies of the world. And here is, I, I don't know, I, I studied Old English, so I find this stuff cool. Francis is really into the Norse, that's one of his backgrounds he knew. Uh, the fruit which contains within it thirst and fresh desire, right? Every time you get what you want, <laughs> it just creates a new, a new craving. Tree into which slouch-hatted, one-eyed Odin thrust a sword of heroes in battle. Um, I wish, I have an image in my computer, Odin, but he's one of the chief gods of Norse mythology, and the story is that he wanted knowledge. So he went to, um, in the roots of the tree of knowledge in Norse mythology, Yggdrasil is its name, there's a dwarf, Mimir was his name, and there's a well at the, uh, base of the roots. And if you drink um, the water of that well, you get knowledge. And uh, uh, Mimir, the dwarf, said, you can have it only if you cut out one of your eyes. So uh, Odin did that. He gouged out one of his eyes and got knowledge. Now, this is something like, or I don't want to attribute it to Francis, but for me, Faye, if I want to bobify that story, give an interpretation of it, you give up dual sight for the one sight, for the one eye. You know, it seems to easily be interpretable that way. I would imagine Francis understood it like that. It's kind of an obvious way of doing it. So uh, he acquired knowledge, Odin did. Let's see. Dream tree of dreamed creation, whose waving branches are the dance of God, Nataraja, I mentioned this last weekend, uh, an image of Shiva, dancing Shiva who creates, preserves, and destroys the universe. That comes up at the beginning of the section on the new life in book one. And makes us crazy and sets us house building and demolishing and again building. Okay, and now he's going to give, uh, you guys probably haven't studied this, but um, he bring, Francis brings us up a, a number of times in State God. Anamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, manasmaya kosha, 
and with Vigyan Maya Kosha, Nananda Maya Kosha. Any of you know what this is? No. Sheets, yeah. And at the center is Atman, the self. And around the self are five sheets. This is Vedanta, the Vedantic account. I don't know, Mitra, have you dealt with that? Yeah. yeah. This is pure Vedanta, which some, I don't know, when Francis was ripping off books from the um, libraries back in the 1930s because he couldn't afford to buy them. Maybe he found one at, on this subject, or maybe the Baron had it in his library up in. Um, where did he live? Outside Sydney. Remember the town? Beacon Hill. But that's where he built the house. But the Baron had a house in. Um, I thought he was in Melbourne, wasn't he? In Victoria? The, the, Baron, was out, the Baron was outside Sydney. He had a oh. house there. Oh, I'm forgetting the name of the town. Okay. Now, near Manakaya. Some should be some Bogakaya and Dharmakaya. Now those are um, it's Mahayana Buddhism. These are the three bodies of the Buddha. In fact. You're saying it's a misspelling? Yeah, it is, and he misspells it elsewhere. It should be some uh, some Bogakaya, some G H, not D H. So I guess when he was Francis was in India, having people run around and prove, you know, look up. All the sources, he missed this one apparently. It needs to be corrected. Samboga Kaya. Any of you who have studied uh, infinite intelligence might recall the word Upa Bog. Any of you remember Upa Bog? Yes. It's the same Bog, it's the same root. Mm -hmm. Samboga Kaya. Sam is all. And uh, these are. Uh, and bog is what? It's like enjoyment. Yeah. Enjoyment, mm -hmm. taking enjoyment of things. And. Um, these are the three bodies of the Buddha in Mahayana Buddhism. It's a later development. And uh, Nirmanakaya is the body of the Buddha which is, presents itself to the eye, our eyes, to the gross conscious, gross sphere. And Sambhogakaya is the body of luminosity or bliss, uh, an inner body of resplendence that the Buddha has. And Dharmakaya is um, the body of truth. It's the real self of the Buddha. Um, yeah. I wonder if it's Slavic and uh, Bog is God. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if it's related. Yeah, that's right, it is. They're both Indo-European uh, languages, so it might be a common root that'd be worth looking at. It would have lost the H, and that would be true. Bog, G, and G in the, uh, West, in the uh, languages from which uh, Slavic is derived, so it could be related. So here we have the five bodies of an ordinary person, right, in the Vedantic account. And here we have the three bodies of the Buddha, or of the avatar. See, so Francis is going from bottom to top here. Light, light. I mean, I'm really so impressed by how he was able to come into mastery of all this material, especially back in those days where in the West, how many people knew about this? The light from the master. You know, actually, what, obviously he was enlightened and connected to the, you know, the avatar of the age. I mean, he, in previous lifetimes, right, he, right? he must have studied all this stuff, and in this lifetime it came right back. Maybe he was like, yeah, because like Sherry are yeah. knew nothing, you know, Baba's father. Yeah, yeah. I mean, then all of a sudden he's translating everything, you know, the, the veil is sure. from him. Or maybe in rural Victoria back in those, those days, they all knew about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, he was a Bohemian, and they did old study that. Uh huh. Um, he was a what? He was a Bohemian, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But most of Christian. But I'll bet you, even among the, the, the set that he encountered in uh, Melbourne, I think he was probably yeah, he was unusual. Was, you know, yeah. Getting ready to be Bob's. Favorite poet, next like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't mean he didn't spend some time reading a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> he clearly was <laughs> incredibly well read and extraordinarily discriminating about what he was yeah. doing. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. I noticed how you wrote in the house building theme mm -hmm. that's from the second pass. He's coming back to it now. That's exactly right. So after the, the second half of this, fourth pass, he comes back to the house building figures again. Yeah. So, and now we're going to have the bricks. Remember bricks, contrariety, stone, and then the material for building it. He uses bricks as a figure for that. Now back there. 
Build we our houses with bricks of impressions, cement of desire. He's developing the metaphor. A brick house. The brick is the impression and cement is what sticks it together. Mixed with tears, right? We suffer. We Our cement, our desire is mixed with tears and that's what keeps us together is all this desire. Build we our houses. So well pleased, so well pleased. Come into my house. Wipe your feet first. Please wipe your feet. Sit we and talk we, smile and be gay. No God talk, please, or allusion to the way talk. God talk and way talk is crank talk, not tea talk. Gay talk for you. <laughs> this is the attitude of the worldly minded, you know? Gay talk for you, gay talk for you, for me talk. With sun reduced sun of Venetian blinds, right? Yeah. The sun is, is, you know, sun and moon are such dominant symbols throughout Stay with God. And sun is that element of God which overwhelms and destroys. No, 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 no. Keep God away. Just a little bit of sun filtering in through my Venetian blinds. In this house of me house built by me, he managed to get like all those me's built into it. Okay, this is sort of the attitude we have towards what my, my, me, mine. Now he's going to give master builder, master builder, the one who built this lousy little house <laughs> builds also universes. <laughs> Spins suns and burning, hums earths around them, spaces them in spacelessness, times them in timelessness and orders the time of their ceasing from turning. Master, look, look, you little soul, think you're, that, that you're living this little life. Look at who you really are. This is who you are. You're not this trivial little thing. Master builder, master builder, self the creator, self the sustainer, self the destroyer. Do you remember that from what speaks? Mm -hmm. Creator, sustainer, destroyer, the third state of God. There are two big chapters that talk about it a lot. The mirror make maker of image of himself, little householder, bright are your tears of happiness and sorrow, portions self-gotten, pitiable your bed and table and bowed walk, pitiable and glorious. Yeah. It's season from turning. Uh, that was the turning was talked about earlier. Yes. Where was that again? Was that in the... In the and now I've forgotten where that is. John Kerry? I, I think... I think book one might have had it too. I've forgotten. Yeah. I remember it now, but in, in the old Buddhist literature, the original, you know, Pali canon of, of Buddhism, I believe that the Buddha had he gave a talk where he uses this imagery about that he's broken the house and that, that it, it will be, I think I think that it may come from that source originally this idea of the house needing to be demolished demolished if you find that I'd like to know where that is one of the Buddhist sutras like the fire sermon or something well, I mean, like that. It, I'm not, it might be in the Dharma Pala but I'm not sure yes yes yeah Okay. Let's see what else. So now coming to the last stanza of the fourth pass. Takes his stance to be revealing the house so carefully built, crumbling bit by bit, before the same fire which baked its bricks. Right? Mm -hmm. He gave us that metaphor earlier. The bricks are actually baked with the fire. But in the course of time, that same fire destroys them. We had in book part two, he taking the fire that hands wet from tears and using it to burn all the trash in his house. Uh, to dust under his glorious feet, to sing his praise or silently adore, or for his wind to blow any wither, or be remolded into useful self-shape for his service. Takes his stand, at last takes his stand, Okay, and now he's going to give an important idea here that's really going to be used um, in the next section. Remember, the, in the first pass, we reread bits of it uh, earlier. There's the moon experience and there's the sun experience, right? And the moon is, you know, there's the thundering of Poseidon and there's the dark wave. 
but they're kind of romantic. And there's the back rush of the surf with sand grains like little universes and the moon huge and yellow and you know wisp of her hair and um, you know honey of kisses all of that sort of thing and then that gives way the next day to hammered streets and Kali licking people into blast furnaces that hideous horrible imagery so the moon in reincarnation is that romance expansiveness beauty promise and the sun is the cruel disillusioner that shows where desire leads to. It leads to uh, unfulfillment, everything, okay? Now this is going to lead in the steps to his feet into the moon path and the sun path. And here he gives an indication of what those are. Takes his stand, at last takes his stand, and rejects the moon road to rebirth and forms delight and pain of nights of cool breeze over warm sands curling a wisp of fragrant hair across brow of unseen dreaming light. Remember this imagery we read that was from the first pass? And near thunder of Poseidon's horses on blue paddock of ocean. What's a paddock? So it's like a stable with a horse. Is that what's not? A paddock is, uh, what would you call it? It's like a field. A field? Sort of a, an enclosed it's field. No, it's not. Well, it's got a fence around it. Pasture. It's yeah. Over. yeah. It's where you put a horse out. Put horses out in a paddock. We don't seem to use it in America. No, you no, don't. We use meadow. Mm -hmm. Where do I think? A meadow. But it particularly has implications of like having like horses in it or, or livestock like that. Yeah, you yeah. do put the horses out to pasture. Yeah, yeah. We say horses out to pasture. Yes, out to pasture, yeah, so it's that idea. But it's now it's Poseidon's horses, so we have an, the ocean is like a paddock for the horses of Poseidon. It's a metaphor. Yeah, it's a beautiful metaphor. It's a beautiful, and Poseidon is who? God of the, God of the ocean. And he's used him throughout this section to represent the forces of the ocean, the thunder of Poseidon, you know, in the distance. When it manifests, it can be terrible. And so now it's the, the paddock where his horses range. And so it's a beautiful uh, figure. And yeah. dawns, and disastrous days of ambition realized or thwarted. Remember, moon and sun. He's using that again. The moon road, that's what the moon road is. That is to say, when you continue to accept the delusive promises of desire, you know, with the romance of all of it, and the beauty and the charm of all of it, and it always dawns into the sun shows what it is, and you see um, the other side of what seems so promising and so beautiful and so charming. And that hideous Kali tongue, the Kali bloody tongue, licking you into blast furnaces, World War II, right? Jews being thrown in. That's always that alternation. That's the moon path. As long as you want to buy into that, as long as you want to buy into these promises, you're going to have the cruel dawn which shows the other side to it. That's the moon road. Rejects it. The moon road to lovely form and fear and hope. And takes the sun road. Death road. Why is it a death road? Yeah. Death of self. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. it destroys you. The sun annihilates and destroys. It's the fire. The fire baked the impressions, but it destroys them. Nobody likes to be destroyed. Does anybody like to be destroyed? You know, the only parts of me, the only parts of me, I love the sun. No, I don't anymore. The only parts of me that I like to have destroyed are the parts that I don't really care about. <laughs> I'll say, oh, I can give that up. Look at me. Well, the fact is I didn't really care about it. If I really care about it, man, whoa! Right? So you have the, de the sun road is the death road. And that's it's death to your false self, to your mind. And, and then there's the son of God who is the healer and one of love that exists as well. And he's, but he's using the sun and moon. He actually, in book one, gave this moon and the sun of Baba. And he talked about the manzali need. The moon is the compassionate, the merciful. The sun is the glorious, the destroying, in fact. Yeah. Could it be more that the shock energy is not 
Yeah, there may be a Shaivism here. Yeah. He's talked a lot about Kailash and uh, that a branch of Shaivism up in Kashmir and now down south has Shiva Shakti. So he might have been, uh, had that in mind too. Shakti being the, the power counterpart. We have Kali is another uh, aspect of the counterpart of Shiva here. The death road to immortal self, capital S. Unborn, undying, bodeless being, knowledge, bliss. That's such or not, right? Or that's close enough for such or not. Yeah, yeah. And chit is kind of consciousness. He uses this, uh, Baba does too in the Universal Prayer. You are the Trinity of truth, knowledge, and bliss, truth being sat. Unborn, undying, a bodeless be uh, who built no houses, only dreamed a dream. It never happened. <laughs> the whole thing is just a dream. That's the fourth pass. Oh, it's time for us to stop, isn't it? So let's read the, the coda. I've been, you know, last time I brought out that each of the four books, uh, five books of Stay With God has a coda. And this isn't called a coda, but it is. It's a one stanza recapitulation of the divine theme. Okay. Once God slept, untroubled in the shadow of dream, unknowledged with knowledge of good and evil. We just had that in the last section, the tree of good and evil. Without knowledge even of himself, being infinite knowledge. Okay, the beyond, beyond state, the beginning of the divine theme. From sleep he awoke and marched out. and unfurled worlds of finiteness, hardness, contrariety. Remember that? Book two is contrariety. And planted them up through the seven kingdoms as banners of false conquest. Why is it a false conquest? You always work out. Yeah, and you're conquering, I'm conquering worm form. I'm conquering bird form. I'm conquering animal form. I'm the Lord Lion, Lord of the Jungle. I am man. I am woman. I master the entire world. It's false because it's outer. It's the outer conquest. The real conquest is conquering yourself. We read last week, the greater war and the lesser war. The greater war is the war against yourself. And stood and took his stand in himself flood. He, he is himself the very flood that he's taking a stand in. Even in this one stanza recapitulation of the divine theme, we have the taking a stand theme. And turned it back and won back to himself, stripping him of not himself. Everything that I am not, I have to cut and strip away. Uh, as he went and arrived glorious in real conquest, the real war from where he started and slept a wake sleep of emptiness, filled with I am God, power, knowledge, bliss, the goal. And that is a magnificent ending to a magnificent book, in my opinion. Okay, well, we resume tomorrow. <laughs>